everyone, and uh, welcome to our online worship service. I, I hope you're well today, and I just want to thank you for your patience and your resiliency with us as we've been having a technical problems that are beyond our control. Uh, we think our Shaw network uh, went down. And so um, I hope that you, um, and I appreciate that you have time and made time to watch this because as we continue our Lenten series and how do we open ourselves to life, this is an exciting uh, service and episode as we continue to see how we can connect and, and how we can connect to life and cherish life and love life and be in relationship to life. You know, there's some things we can't count on. We can count on most days the sun rising and setting. We can count on the air to breathe. Sometimes people can count on water that's safe to drink. But when it comes to technology, as you, I think, know and as I know, uh, sometimes we can't count on it. So thank you once again for inviting us into your life and space and homes here from MacKillop United Church. And thank you for all the ways that you give. Uh, I feel so privileged uh, that, that you give um, to people in your life, to other nonprofits, and to here at MacKillop. And if you're watching this for the first time or have been a while and you'd like to, to give because you value our ministry and helps you in your life, you can always go to our website at mckillopunited.ca slash donate. And there are many ways that uh, you can give. And as always, as we gather, we like to affirm each other, whoever you are and however we identify ourselves. This is a place and a space and a time where we can cherish each other and where we affirm each other and we support each other as we gather right now. As we begin our time, I think it would be lovely to have a time of guided meditation. Uh, what will happen is I'll lead you through a, a guided meditation, and then we'll have a, a moment of silence, and then we'll have a short prayer as we begin our service. I would uh, like, before we begin the guided meditation video, just to invite yourselves to remember a tree was there ever a time when you would lay underneath a tree and, and just lay there and hear the sound of the wind going through the tree or see the animals or the birds going through it and just, just start to feel connected with the tree and with the ground and with life around you? That's going to be our guided meditation. And this is a, uh, a, a video of a tree in our yard, uh, which I lie underneath. So as we begin this, this guided meditation, this video, just imagine, you might want to keep your eyes open and just watch the, the tree on your screen, or you might want to close your eyes. So just as the video begins, hear, hear the wind, hear the birds, hear life. You might want to imagine yourself lying on the ground and the warm sunshine upon your face. And once in a while you look up and you see the strong trunk going upward into the blue sky. And you see the strong branches. And you just begin to let go of everything that your mind and your ego and your emotions want you to cling to or worry about or try and fix and solve. You start to smell the earth, the fragrance wafting from the trunk and the tree and the dried leaves around you. And you breathe in life and you hear life and you feel life. You might even imagine or begin to feel right now in your body that you start to feel this deep connection with the earth. You feel the tree inviting you to be deeply rooted into Mother Earth and to allow your arms to spread out and your heart to open to the flow of life around you and the source of life who invites you just to be as you are. 
and to know that you're like this tree. In this moment, you're, you're beautiful. There's no judgments. You know, the tree doesn't judge how it looks. The tree doesn't judge what's happening around it. It has this faith in the connections of life that it's part of. You might start to feel this vibrancy in your heart area, this presence. You can't explain this feeling a little heavier in your body and alive and a sense of subtle peace and joy. Just breathe it in right now. Be present in this moment. A source of life, thank you that we can continue to feel life and be with life and the miracle of life, and that all of us are precious, and all of this planet is precious, that we're all spiritual beings on this amazing journey. Help us to awaken to this, even in the midst of all that's happening in our lives and the world, with our continued journey with the pandemic, with all the turmoil that we witness, that we may not lose our connection our reciprocity, our respect and love of life. Amen. You know, I forgot in all the hustle and tussle of, <laughs> of technology not working today that, you know, we're, it's spring now. Yesterday on Saturday, March the 20th, was the first day of spring. And I don't know about you, but when spring comes, I, I start to think of, of seeds, of new growth and life and what they can teach us. And in this scripture reading and, and in this time of uh, musical meditation, we hear uh, the life of the seed and the invitation to understand what a seed shares with us. Everyone and everything is in relationship, and all are dependent on others. All beings, human and non-human, are given gifts and have a responsibility to share their gifts with others, while not ask, asking for or expecting anything in return. This morning's reading is taken from John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you this. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a simple grain. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Very truly, I tell you this. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it will remain a simple grain. But if it dies, it produces much fruit.
Thank you. Thank you, Peter and John Paul. Well, today we're exploring again uh, how we can be connected to life, how we can open to life. And one of the ways um, is reciprocity. And this book, um, The Wolves Are Back by uh, uh, Jean Craighead George and paintings by Wendell Minor is, um, is a subtle way to talk about that. And it's published by Denton's Children's Book. So I hope you're ready to learn about wolves because it is, in some ways, a true story. So let's read it. The wolves are back. The wolf pup pricked up his ears, pattered out of the den, and followed his father down the slope. They jogged through the lush grasses to the bank of the Larimer River in Yellowstone National Park. They came upon the carcass of an elk their pack had felled. The wolves were back. The pup watched his father eat. Then he too tore off a bite. Two ravens stuffed themselves. A golden eagle carried off food for her eaglets. A grizzly. Bear sat nearby, waiting for the wolves to leave so she could eat in peace. Three magpies snatched quick bites. Mice chewed on calcium-filled antlers. Two sexton beetles buried a piece of meat to eat later. The valley was sharing food again. The wolves were back. Where had they been? Shot. Everyone. Many years ago, ranchers, hunters, and, and rangers were told to shoot every wolf they saw. They did. By 1926, there were no more wolves in the 48 states of the United States of America. No voices howled. The thrilling choruses of the wilderness were silenced. The wolves were gone. The deer, elk, antelope, the gentle animals looked beautiful in photographs. They wandered in tranquil herds. Peace reigned in the wilderness. The wolves were gone. Time passed. Visitors to wild America yearned to hear wolves. When they learned that no wolf had ever attacked a person in North America, they urged that the wolves be returned to their home. In 1995, 10 adult wolves were brought down from Canada and set free in Yellowstone National Park. They dug dens and bore puppies. First there were three packs, then there were five. In six years, there were 21 packs. They howled and sang to each other. Hikers stopped and marveled at the sound. The wolves were back. The pup who had followed his father to eat, heard a vesper sparrow sing. This songster had not been in the valley for almost a century. The vast elk herds had eaten the grasses the little bird needed for food and nesting material. When the wolves returned, they frightened the elk up into the mountains. The grasses grew tall. The sparrows raised their babies and sang. The wolves were back. The wolf pup heard a flycatcher call. The valley had not heard this flycatcher while the bison were there. Bison break and trample young trees to keep back the forest so there will be grass. Now the wolves hunted the bison and drove them back from the river. Without the bison, the aspens grew. While with the trees restored, there were limbs for the flycatcher to perch on. They sat there and sang. The wolves were back. When grass and aspen were deep along the riverbanks, erosion was stopped. Willows grew. Beavers arrived and felled the willows and ate the bark and made dams with logs. The dams formed palms. Wild birds, fish, and frogs flocked to the ponds. Dragonflies zoomed above them. The pup peered ahead. In front of him sat one of the few coyotes 
that the wolves had not killed when they first arrived in the valley. After the wolves thinned out the coyotes, the number of ground squirrels that the coyotes fed upon increased. Ground squirrels were the badger's main food. Badgers moved back into the valley, now rich with ground squirrels. The badgers ate well and dug tunnels for homes. The wolves were back. The grizzly bear shared the wolf's kill and had two and even three big, fat, healthy cubs. The wolf pack with his father ate until his stomach was round and then followed his father back to their den. They walked through gardens of wildflowers. The wolves had scared the mountain sheep that chew the flowers to the ground up into the rocky cliffs. Flowers filled the valley. Bees and butterflies that fed on the flowers returned. Warblers sang. Hummingbirds brightened the valley. Like pieces in a kaleidoscope, the broken parts of the wilderness were tumbling into place. The wolves were back. The pup grew up. He was taught to hunt by his father and mother. He helped take care of the next litter of puppies, and then he left home. The young male went south where he met a mate from the Yellowstone Delta Pack. They trotted side by side into the Teton wilderness and dug a den along the Snake River. They scared the elk away. They scattered the bison. They frightened the sheep into the cliffs. The grasses grew tall. The river bank stopped eroding. Willow and aspen trees flourished. Beaver built ponds. Birds sang. Flowers blossomed. The wilderness is in balance again. The wolves are back. <coughs> the wolves are back by Jean... Craig George. Ah, what a what a lovely, true children's story about the deep interconnection and symbiosis of all of life. And in some ways, it's what I yearn to experience again. I don't know about you. But with this pandemic, uh, I have felt this calling to have a reconnection with uh, life in its real life way, not in all these human systems we create. And there's nothing wrong with these human systems, although they might be a little bit of out of balance with life, in my opinion. But what the, the wolves are back brings up for me about symbiosis is this word. If we find this word, I think we once again find a deeper connection with ourselves, with the life within us, and life everywhere. And this word is reciprocity. You know, all the different uh, synonyms of reciprocity are, are collaboration, mutualism, symbiosis, fellowship, friendship, and solidarity. Reciprocity, when you look at all these words, means that there's this deep interdependence. There's this deep connection that, that you, you can't make life into a series of objects. But what's really happening is life is this communion of subjects. And when we find this with reciprocity, what we find in this next slide is, is that we find our proper place and relationship to the world. So reciprocity is not about being nice or being kind, but it's a position of respect. It's a position of independence. There's these deep gifts that we're in relationship to. And what we find is it's not power over or under, but what we do is we find our proper place. And when we find our proper place, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, of this video that was produced um, by uh, a, a spoken artist and rapper called Prince E.I. Fun fact, planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. 
Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes, but at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now, so no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens, and we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before, or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before, because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lion gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much, the only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best, we are just right. This paradise where we are given medicine from trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family, literally. Everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish. And this is what we must recognize before it's too late because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture. It is us. These problems are symptoms of us, byproducts of us. Our inner reflection, loss of connection has created this misdirection. We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of Mother Nature. Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected, but they have underestimated our strength. Contrary to popular belief, millions are waking up out of their sleep, seeing our home being taken right up under our feet. We cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe with ingredients we can pronounce drink water that is clean marvel at trees breathe air free of toxins these are natural rights not things that can be bargained for in congress see they want you to feel powerless but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world but when enough people come together we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection freedom for all without oppression but it is up to you Yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second. I find that analogy, that metaphor so profound that in a 24-hour clock of the history of Earth that we are three seconds. For me, that brings up reciprocity. For me, what that does is it says that, you know what, we, this, whole, this whole thing is, is that we're really small, that we're really just part of it. We're not over and above. We're not separate from this planet. We're not separate from all the life. And when we do that, that's when we lead into everything that we're experiencing right now and we're facing right now as a species, that we're actually, we're actually losing life. We're losing symbiosis. We're losing collaboration. We're losing mutual 
uh, mutualism. We're losing reciprocity uh, by, by thinking we're different or better from the soil and the trees and everything, and it is us. And so to find life, we have to find these relationships again. We have to fall back in love with nature and animals and plants, and we have to change. I hope it doesn't lead you to despair because that's not the point. We're not headed to despair. What we're headed to is actually hope and life. Robin, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a, a Potawatomi First Nation woman. She's also a scientist and botanist. Um, she has written this amazing book called uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. And about 30 people in MacKillop in the community have been reading this. And she has these quotes on reciprocity. First of all, she says, in natural systems, of course, there is no goal other than the peripheration perif of life. Try and say that five times, peripheration of life. And so reciprocity is about, in our natural systems, it's, it's all about everything is there to flourish and survive. It's like you need the wolves. You need, you need the top predators. You need everything for life to flourish or nothing flourishes. Everything has a gift to give, and that is reciprocity. She goes on to say this, action on behalf of life transforms because the, rela the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting in, enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And so we don't have to get it right. It's not about being enlightened or saved, she says. To find and experience reciprocity is actually just to work to give the gifts we have as human beings in relationship and love and respect to the deep gifts the earth gives us, even gives us when she is deeply wounded right now. It reminds me of how uh, Sue Swan sees. She's a scientist of biomimicry, and she talks about this in this Green Renaissance video called Regenerative Living. sustainability is one of my least favorite words in the English language I think it's so limiting you know if I said to you what's your relationship like with your partner and you said to me oh, it's sustainable I'd say shame I'm sorry to hear that yeah or it would sound like gosh you're just hanging in there and I think nature is so much more vibrant than that you know it's attuned it's responsive it's resilient and I think critically important it's regenerative so I would say, if anything, that's what we should be striving for, is regenerative living. What we can learn from this whole forest system, how all the different species are sharing one particular territory. There's no waste at all. That's the, the, the big difference, um, is that we have come in and we have made chemicals combine that have never been combined in 3.8 billion years. And so the Earth can't recognize that, can't assimilate it, can't break it down. Really, we're acting like a species that doesn't belong. We are acting like aliens who don't understand that this is a closed system planet, a finite size planet. I believe with all my heart that we can create cities and towns that are functioning like a forest. The blueprint is here. How to really thrive on this planet is all around us. It is with humility that we need to actually ask nature, what should we be doing? And then with equal humility, start to apply that. I do think you need to get out into nature. So you need to reconnect, whether it's the little park on the corner. No patch of nature is too small 
to actually start your journey of discovery. We are capable of so much more as a species and we will be so much happier as a species as a result. So to discover reciprocity, to actually experience it is to be in relationship. And what Robin is suggesting and what Sue is suggesting, uh, both who have PhDs in the science world who are very smart but also wise, is, is that to have reciprocity, to have relationship is to actually listen and to learn and to have respect and humility. So one of the first things we could do to discover is that is, is that the the plants, the non-human beings, they're not they're not they're beings. They have a life. They have a soul. Uh, the plants and the water and the ecosystem, the animals, is as if we want to to heal and to grow and to find reciprocities. We need we need to start listening to them. We need to start learning from them. That they they're actually as smart as us in different ways, and they have a wisdom to share a wisdom that birthed us and is waiting for us to come back again and to find this reciprocity and this healing that is more infinite and gracious in many ways than all that we have done with our human systems and how we can bring them back together. And you can do that by just going in your backyard and going in the parks and going the mountains around here. Robin Kimmerer, believes that another way that we can find reciprocity is by how we look and interact with this living world. And she calls it the honorable harvest. If I could choose just a single element of the traditional teachings that we're called to pick up, it would be the teachings of the honorable harvest, which were taught us by the plants who give us everything that we need. It's a covenant of reciprocity between humans and the living world, a very sophisticated ethical protocol. One of the first steps of the Honorable Harvest is to understand that the lives that we are taking are the lives of generous beings, of sovereign beings. And in order to accept their gift, we owe them at least our attention. To care for them, we must know what they need. And at the very minimum, we should know their names. And yet, the average American can name over a hundred corporate logos and ten plants. Is it a surprise that we have accepted a political system that grants personhood to corporations and no status at all for wild rice and redwoods? The protocols for the Honorable Harvest are not really written down, but if they were, it would look something like this. When you get to the woods, you don't just start grabbing everything in sight. We're taught never to take the first plant that you see, and that means you'll never take the last. This is a prescription with inherent conservation value. And then if we encounter another plant, we ask permission. I've always been taught to address that plant, to introduce myself and tell it what it is that I have come for. If you're going to take a life, you have to be personally accountable for it. I know there are places where if you talk to a plant, they think you are crazy, but in our way, it's just good manners. If you're going to ask, you have to listen for the answer. You can listen in different ways, pragmatically, intuitively. Look around, see whether those plants have enough to share. And if the answer is no, you go home. For we remember that they don't belong to us. And taking without permission is also known as stealing. And the Honorable Harvest counsels that we also take in such a way that does the least harm and in a way that benefits the growth of the plant. Use everything that you take. It's disrespectful of the life that's given to waste it. The next tenet of the Honorable Harvest is to share it with others, human and non. The earth has shared generously with us, so we have to model that behavior in return. And a culture of sharing we know is a culture of resilience. Plant gatherers often leave a spiritual gift behind, but it can also be a material gift weeding, caretaking, spreading seeds, helping those plants to flourish. We give songs, we give ceremony, we give our respect, we give fertilizer. Every breath that you take 
is a breath that was made for you by plants. And the water that you drink, whether you're in an urban setting, whether you're on a remote mountaintop, we still are recipients of those gifts. And if we take the time to be grateful, that brings us into that state of humility, of understanding that we are not at the top of a biological hierarchy, that in fact we are the younger brothers of creation. So, you know, we are, um, we are invited in with reciprocity to, to enter into this regenerative, this restorative, symbiotic life where we, where we t give the gifts of what we have back to the gifts we've been given from this amazing planet and all the life and all the beings on it that sustain us when, when there's nothing we can ask for. In this quote from Robin Kimmerer, she says another way that we can honor reciprocity is this way, from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. We can use our dollars as the indirect currency of reciprocity. Perhaps we can think of the honorable harvest as a mirror by which we judge our purchases. What do you see in the mirror? A purchase worthy of the life consumed? Dollars become a surrogate, a proxy for the harvester with the hands in the earth, and they can be used in support of the honorable harvest or not. And so what I think we're being invited into with, with uh, this ethos, this relationship of reciprocity, is are we going to start our model our lives on the depth and wisdom of this planet that sustains us and births us, accepts us when we die, and creates new life and is ever giving such amazing gifts. Really, it's like that simple verse we heard from the Gospel of John. Unless a seed of wheat falls into the ground, it just remains a solitary seed. But if it falls into the ground, it bears much fruit and much harvest. Do you see how it's a verse of reciprocity? It's by letting go into relationship of love and respect and care of how we spend our money, of how, how we view other beings on this planet that we create life together or we actually don't create life, we destroy it. And so as we go about our life, maybe this week you, maybe you'll find some reciprocity with nature, maybe the most unexpected places or, how you, or what you spend your money on or how you talk to the plants in your neighborhood or listen to the birds or learn from them because there's this deep life yearning for us to heal the earth and be healed by the earth and to live in deep respect and reciprocity. Amen. To show by touch and word devotion to the earth, to hold in full regard all life that comes to birth. We need, O oh God, the will to find the good you had of old in mind. Renew Yeah.
like to invite us now into a, a time of prayer, a prayer for our world, for ourselves and for others, as we continue to, you know, try and get through this pandemic. I know we're impatient for things to go back to some post-pandemic uh, new normal, to be with family, to feel safe. Um, and we do hope that going through this experience, our world will be healed and changed too. And there'll be a time of silence. And then at the end of the prayer, we'll join together in the words uh, that Jesus uh, taught his disciples to pray. So let us join together in this moment of prayer for healing and for life. O Spirit of life, help us not to let despair and grief and worry and anxieties overwhelm us so that we shut down or tune out or try and numb ourselves with mass media and consumption or even feel powerless that we cannot make a difference. But instead, we pray, O oh divine, that we may realize in our bodies and hearts that one act of love and forgiveness, one act of listening, of seeing, one act of giving the gifts of our lives brings healing to others, to nature, and to life. Help us to listen to the earth, to the plants, to the water, to the sky, to the wind, to the calls of animals and birds and insects, to the still small voices of mosses and lichens and other creatures we can't see. For we are searching for a deep healing of our own human systems and all of life. And we pray for all the suffering that is created and the suffering we have no control over and the suffering that hurts people. We pray for prejudice and fear. We pray for healings of those who are suffering from illness of body or mind and spirit for those who are struggling because of COVID or grieving because of those who are sick or have died or burning out because of all they're giving on the front lines or at home or just caught in a spiral of darkness. Help us, O oh Christ, to awaken to the miracle of life even in the midst of everything to the sweet smells of spring coming, to the smiles of those who love us, and to the hope that we can make a difference. And so in this moment of silence, we offer you our own prayers. So we gather all these prayers together, the ones we've spoken out loud, the ones we hold in our hearts, the ones we can't find words for, the ones that scare us, the ones that bring us hope and yearning with the one prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our breathing life, who art in everything, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, Thank you for your patience today, and thank you if you're watching this. 
I hope you are doing as well as you can, and I hope you do get a chance to go outside and to sense the coming spring, to sense the reciprocity of life that's waiting for you and with you and in you and through you, that everything is connected and that uh, life is waiting for you. As always, if you need anything, we are here for you. Uh, please call us at 403-328-2703, or you can go to our website, uh, mckillopunited.ca, or our Facebook site for see what's happening. Uh, because we are here for you and our community, and when you thrive and our community thrive, which is really, again, another way to say reciprocity, then we thrive. It's all connected into this amazing web. As we go from here today, um, we have a beautiful visual blessing about, uh, about life and the earth, which leads us into then a song by the many as a time for blessing. So until we meet again, uh, may you be safe. May you be well. May you know that you are not alone, but actually connected to this miracle of life. Take care until we meet again, and peace be with you. May everything in creation become a catalyst for your self-understanding. Let the sacred whispers carry down the wind invite you to release what is not necessary. Let the breezes help your wings to ascend, the sparrows to remember your flock. Let the divine fire that burns in your heart kindle you to deeper compassion, sunlight to seek illumination. Let the rivers and seas support you in allowing spirit to flow through your life in new ways, embracing the rise and fall within you. Let the pine cones contain an epiphany. The forest ask you to embrace your truth once again. And each smooth stone a revelation. Let the moon sing of quiet miracles, like those which reveal and conceal the world every day right before your eyes. May you make time to listen to the elements and their wisdom, revealing the Holy One's face and the sacred direction for your one precious life.
us be a sign of hope. Let us be your arms of love. Let us be the one.